Recently, I read a, uh, an article. About, about the greens. I was intrigued with the article. Because it, it described what takes place when young men, young women join the Marines. And I, I was intrigued because of several things. One is, is that when they come into this open open room they are greeted but then there are these yellow footprints that are on the floor and according to the the article every prospective marine has to stand find his find a set of footprints and stand on those footprints and those footprints represent, again, that they are present and accounted for. And then as, as I was reading more in the article, I uh, discovered as well that the Marines require that any prospective candidate who will pass the rigors of becoming a Marine they have to, they're required to leave everything behind. Everything. Not cell phone, clothes, not even their underwear. Everything. They leave it. And in fact, what they receive is what's called government issue. <laughs> and they become... GIs. And those of you who are have been in the military, you help me if I get this wrong. Um, am I right? Okay, okay. Any GIs in here? Ex GIs. And I hope I hope I'm not causing you flashbacks and <laughs> psychological trauma. <laughs> God bless you, Will. Uh, but the military wants to impress on them that from that moment forward on those yellow footprints going forward for as long as they are in the Marines, particularly as they're going through this phase of training, going forward, the Marines and the commander will be everything to them. Everything. And in fact, I, I've heard uh, some just jokingly say, I'll, I'll, I'll I'm your mother, your father, just your everything. And, and so what they want is, and demand it, absolute surrender of their will. And that's really what they're after. They want to break the will of every candidate so that that candidate no longer has his own will and his own will now becomes the will of the, the commander. In other words, he wants to be able to manage the will of every one of those men and women that will be under his command. So he wants to erase, as it were, the, the past to the degree that they're able to connect in a, in a regimented way connecting with leadership. Amen. That no longer are they there to express their own personal identity. It's gone. At least for the time that they're in training. I want you to hear the words of, of Jesus once again in light of this. I'm reading from Mark 14, verse 25. A great multitude went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. That sounds much like the drill sergeant in the Marines. 
who basically wants to take all of the relationships, the past relationships, and what he wants to do, he wants to supersede the authority of everyone else in the life of that Marine. Exactly what Jesus is doing with those who think they want to follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus requires this. He says, you can't be my disciple unless you do something with your will. Unless you do something with relationships, because this is the issue. Jesus does not want other relationships to get in the way of his role in your life. So he becomes the primary authority in the life of those who follow. And if he's not your primary authority, then you are not following Jesus. The only way you can be his disciple is that if he becomes your primary authority, your primary relationship above what? Father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. And your own life. Imagine that. That even your own will, your own tendency to view life your way. He wants to reconstruct it and make it conform again to his authority. Luke 14. Yes. My goodness. This, I, I tell you, I tell you. Thank you for that. I, I guess that's why some of you were still looking. Huh? <laughs> where, where are you? I think I think a couple of weeks ago I, I said the sun rises in the west, <laughs> sets in the east. I, and and some of you helped me with that, you know, afterwards, and I, I appreciate that. So what what is this? I you, you know this is I, this is to illustrate. I did that to illustrate what. <laughs> No, no, not at all. I did not. <laughs> uh, uh, but but, but um, I, I do appreciate the interaction. I, I really do. That, that lets me know you're following Amen. and you're connecting. So I appreciate that. Keep me on track. And it does illustrate the, the, um, the, the fact that even a, a man opening the scripture can, can fail, can, can miss it, can say the wrong thing. But I appreciate your, your, um, your helping me with those matters. Thank you so much. Again, the, the point being here in um, Luke 14, we started at verse 25. Jesus says, commands that disciples need to hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and yea, even your own life. That your own life should not be so um, important to you that it exceeds your responsibility to follow Jesus. And many, many a disciple of Jesus Christ has been faithful to this call. That's why many of them were put to death. Because Christ called upon them to follow him even if it cost you your life. And I'm not so sure that we have that kind of, of um, followership with regard to Jesus Christ today. Our, our um, wills have been weakened, I, I believe, in, in terms of the church to conform ourselves to this type of, of arduous demand on the part of our Savior. He has every right to expect complete, total submission of your will and your obedience. He has every right to, to expect that you and I will follow him regardless of what it costs. Regardless. And if you're not there, if there are reservations about how far you will go, how far you, um, or what you will do, if you want to maybe pause and say, well, this is as far as I can go. I, I just want to... Um, draw you back to what Jesus said. You can't be his disciple. Why, why are we here? Why are we here? We, we're, we're here because we're, we're talking about the idea of 
what it takes to to seek Jesus, to be after him. And we're, we're pondering this matter because in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus commanded the Ephesus church to remember from where they have fallen, to repent, that is, change their mind, and to return to the first works, redo what you used to do. And so when we were looking at this, this idea there in, in Revelation 2, we're, it led us to this question. If Jesus says, redo the first works, an immediate question comes to mind. Well, what are the first works? The first thing we do, if, if we're going to renew our devotion and love for Jesus Christ, it requires this kind of, of submission of our spirits. It requires us to really analyze, is, is this really what I want? In fact, Jesus says that, describes that in, in this passage. Since you're there in, in, in Luke, are you there with me? Yes. He says in verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock. And they'll say, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Amen. Or what king going to make war against any other king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 or to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. It takes, it takes this, what we're doing. It takes this to follow Jesus. Amen. It takes this kind of personal, inward look. Do I have that fire in the belly, as the seals call it? Can, can I fulfill these requirements? Many, many a man standing on those yellow footprints in, in that big room where the Marines gather, many, many don't make it because they can't manage the rigors of what it takes to become a Marine. And, and, and you know what they, they want to do? Oh, they want to break you. They, they want to break your will. They, they want to mold it. They want to fashion it such that when he says stand, you don't look at him and say, for what? Who do you? You ain't my daddy. See, he, he want, he's going to break that. You're not standing in the face of a, a sergeant in the Marines. No, he, he'll, he'll make you a special project. You'll, you'll become a special project because what he wants to do is mold that will. And that's exactly what Jesus wants to do in our lives. If we're seeking him, in order to seek him, it requires this kind of introspection. Am I willing to yield unequivocally, without question? Am I able to yield my will to Jesus Christ? under those kinds of conditions, so that even my own life, I hate my life if it gets in the way of following Jesus. And, and that, Jesus said, count the cost. So this, this idea of seeking Jesus is, is demanding without any pretense. He didn't make any pretense about it. In fact, he deliberately, he deliberately, he sees multitudes of people following him. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says there in verse 25, great multitudes went with him. But he turned and said to them, if any of you comes to me and does not hate. See, he, what he wants to do, he deliberately wants to thin the crowd. 
Because in the multitude, when, when you've got crowds of people, you've got a huge mix. You've got a mix of folk. And, and every time the church opens, every time the church um, does, does what we do in terms of corporate worship, there's a mix of people that gather in the assembly. Some, some who are not there for, for a genuine and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Some just come because it's the religious thing to do. It's, 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 the, um, it's customary. My mother, my father, they did this. They brought us to church, so I'm just doing it because... And, and, and so what, what Jesus does, he wants to thin the crowd. Yes, sir. And he wants the crowd to do this work of looking in, looking in. Are you really, do you really want me? If you really want me, this is what it takes. What? Hate your life. And, and the, the idea is hate is not this, this um, passion of, of, um, of, um, of anger toward or a, a, it, it's more about setting a priority. The idea, concept of hate in this context. It's where Jesus is, is putting a, um, a priority on, on his, his place. And so when you look at what you do, how you feel about Jesus, your love and devotion for him should be so dynamic that when you look at your love for yourself and your love for others, it looks like, almost looks like hate. Amen. Can't even compare it. So I said, Jesus says, hate your life. Don't value it. Hate it. <laughs> Don't. Put value on your life. You put value on your life, get out of line. Am I, am I? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly what he's saying. And, and I'm telling you, beloved, well, our, our, our problem in the modern church today is that we value, we value ourselves. We value, we, we highly esteem ourselves. And it gets in the way of seeking Jesus. Jesus, you can't seek Jesus dragging your bags, all of your belongings, and all of your, no, like the Marines, stand on that yellow, leave your cell phone, your clothes, everything. What does he want to do? He wants to issue your uniform. He wants to give you your clothes. He wants to give you your food. He wants to give you your, your, your sense of enjoyment. He, he, wants, he wants to dictate your life. He wants to form your thinking so that now you're not thinking as an independent agent. Now you're thinking as part of a corporate body. My body. Jesus called it his body. And, and the church, the Ephesus church, I believe in, in terms of why they left their first love. He, he's speaking to the church. He, he's not talking to individuals. He's talking to the church of Ephesus in, in Revelation chapter 2. Remember, repent, and redo. The church can drift. In fact, I was reading another article uh, this week uh, about this idea of, of organizational drift. Where organizations, they can, they, they can start out on, with a vision, a mission, that they exist for this reason, and they're going to be doing this and that and the other. But over time, an organization can just drift. Oh, it starts doing that, starts adding this, it starts, and, and organizations can drift away from their original vision. And, and in Ephesus, I, I believe that that's exactly what's going on in the Ephesus church, the Philadelphia church, the, the Smyrna church, the Pergamon. Every one, all seven of those churches, I believe, except maybe for the Philadelphian church, that all six of those churches experienced organizational drift. Manna. We are, were vulnerable relative to drifting. We, we can organizationally, we can drift at, as an organization away from our corporate call. What, what are we called to do as a body? Yes, sir. See, we don't want to lose that. 
don't want to lose that. See, he, he wants to fashion our thinking, mold our minds, our concepts. In, in other words, organizational drift is, is this idea of, of moving away from our design. Right. What were we designed to be? And function, in this case, follows form. Let me explain. We do what we do because of what we are. You following me? So our form is going to dictate our function. What are we by way of form? We are a body. We're a body. And we want, we want the DNA of what our bodies were designed to do. We want that to be consistent throughout every member of this body. So that every member standing on those yellow footprints knows what we're here for, why we exist. And, and now, now hear me, do not, do not misunderstand me, hear me, please hear me. The, the church was not designed to be the place where we give away things. Don't, no, stay with me. We, we give away things because of our form. Our function is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? That, that's, we've been called, that's part of our DNA, it's written in the code of the church. And, and so our, our, our function is, is dictated by, by the form, by that DNA. And what we don't want to do, we don't want to drift away from what we've been designed to be, designed to do. We're, we, we, yeah, we, we do. We do give food and clothing. We, we are. We, we want to reach this community in a loving, compassionate. We want to reach out and touch and the people in their lives and their struggles. But none of those things in terms of, of our outreach, the ultimate reason of, of our giving away food is so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we, if we drift from that, as nice as it is, as kindly as it is to give and to give, when we drift away from our design, we become something else. Jesus says to the Ephesus church, you have left your food. You've, you've done what? I think they drifted. I think they drifted. And, and to prevent organizational drift, what, what we want to do, we, we want to make sure that every, every member of Man of Bible Baptist Church understands the, the DNA that's in them. The code. In fact, when you got saved, the Spirit of God encoded you. He, he placed in you that DNA so that, in fact, Paul says here in Ephesians, go with me to Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4. Did I say Ephesians? Yes. All right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4. And, and now, what did I just say? I just said that when you, when you got saved, the Spirit of God encoded you. He stamped. He sealed you with his Spirit. And when, he, when, when his Spirit entered your spirit, your soul, the merging of, of your soul with, with the Spirit of God, you became a new man. Yes, amen. When, when, you, when you joined the Marines, if those of you who are Marines, now if I'm talking to Army guys, you know, the Army and the Marines, they, they just, you know, they don't get along. But 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 I want, want you to know. See that that's why that's why when 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 you join when you join uh, um, uh, this this church when you become a me a member of Man of Bible we are doing our best to determine that you're first a member of Christ's body. Okay, you 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 first have to be saved to become a member of the body of Christ. In order to really fellowship, fellowship deeply and genuinely with, with this body. 
Um, we, we have to get saved first. So when, when, you, when you get saved, the Spirit of God comes into your life and he stamps your soul. You become a new man. Those Marines are going to turn out as new men. They're not going to be the men and women that they were when they walked through those doors. They're going to be saying, no, sir, yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, yes, ma'am. They, they will, their minds and wills will have been changed and altered. That's what Jesus wants to do in us. And, and in order to, to uh, make that happen, he fills us with his spirit. So that now this DNA, this code is operating in us. And, and now we find ourselves doing what? We find ourselves reading scripture. That's right. Amen. We find ourselves on a Sunday morning um, sitting in church listening to a man drone on. <laughs> when, 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 you could, when you could be home preparing for, for the football game, you know. You, you find when, when, when he stamps your spirit, you find yourself being drawn to the word of God. Amen. You find what, what, what is it? it? It's the pages with, with words and, and, and st you, you find that there's a connection that, that goes on when you, when you get in the book and when you, when you see the passage and the passage says, the Lord is my shepherd and it speaks to you in a way that it never spoke before. Amen. The, the word becomes alive. And then, then you find yourself reading it. Then you find yourself memorizing the Bible. Memor what? Mem memorizing scripture. You, you, when, when your spirit connects with his, he draws you to this place where he wants to affirm in you his will for you. And part of that is, is yes, reading the scripture, memorizing, teaching, and preaching. You're, you're assembling together. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, look, as we see the day of Jesus Christ approaching, we should be spending more and more time together. That's right. Hebrews chapter 10. We sing. We worship him in song. We spend time breaking bread together. We spend time fellowshipping together. We, we spend time outside of these walls with other saints who are connected. Oh, you, you, we, we've got to do this, beloved. We, we've got to deepen our... our um, Connection with each other. Why? I want to take you to this passage, Ephesians 4. Look at Ephesians 4. You with me? In Ephesians 4, I'm starting, I'm going to read at uh, verse 11. And he, that is Christ, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. For the work of the ministry. That is, God has placed, the Lord Jesus has placed in the body men who can equip and the, 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 the saints for the work of the ministry. Is that what you read in, in verse uh, 12? He, he gave these gifts to the body so that the body could be equipped to do what? To do the work of the ministry. So the ministry is done through the body. Every member of the body is ministering to the body. So that the body can be edified. That's what verse 12 says. For the edifying of the body. And, and look at verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So let's do it again. One more time. He gave gifts. The gifts are the pastors, the um, evangelists, prophets, and, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints so that the saints can do the ministry of what? Edifying the body. How does the body get built up? The body gets built up because the members of the body are doing what? Are equipped to use their gifts in the body so that the body can continue to grow. And the Bible says until, how, how do we grow? Look at it, verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, the oneness of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God. So part of our growth is to bring about unity. Another part of our growth, which helps us to grow, is the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. Unto a perfect man, a mature man, me, uh, the measure and the fullness of Jesus Christ. Look uh, one more time. I'm going to skip down to verse 15. Look at this. But speaking the truth in love, this is how we do it. We do it in love. We do it in love. We, we share our gifts. We minister to others. We, we're graceful. We, we need to be very uh, gracious in, in our ministry that, that whatever we do in word or thought or deed, we're to do it in love, with love, with grace. Look at this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him. So th the intent of, of what he has in the DNA is that the body would grow. 
And then the Bible says in verse 16, Christ is the head, and from the head the whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part, here it is, does its share. It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What I just read suggests that the body will grow when every part, every member of that body, does their share. Amen. Is that what you read? Amen. So if we were to measure the health of this body based on every body doing their share, are we healthy? No, we're not. I think, I think we, we have drifted. I, I think the DNA has, has been in, in many ways corrupted in, in us, that what he has placed in us now has been corrupted because we've drifted away from our design. This week um, I um, went to the, uh, to the doctor and the doctor, excuse me a moment, my, um, my lips said, hands, I need a drink. Now the, thank you, <laughs> member of the body comes to, God bless you soldier, <laughs> comes to serve and he served, praise God. Um, the, the whole I idea is, is that everybody does their share. That indicates the health of the body. So if you have a body where only 20% are working and the 80% are doing nothing, you don't have a healthy body. I went, went to the doctor this week and at our men's um, ministry, I was sharing with them that uh, the doctor um, took some blood and he did a few other things that I won't talk about in mixed company. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those uh, times where every man looks forward to that. Uh, in fact, you you can't be a marine unless you. Um, <laughs> man, he 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 took blood, and he determined that based on based on the blood, my blood, that my PSA is high. PSA is this antigen that's in the blood, and the antigen in the blood um, can become cancerous. And so he wants to um, do a biopsy on me to, to determine if my uh, prostate has become cancerous, or if part of it, or what have you. So yeah, do, do pray for me. The point I'm going after is is this idea of every body, every member of the body doing its part. And reading up on it, what this, this idea of cancer, cancer is, is, a, is a vile, wicked attack against the body, against, in fact, against the, the DNA. Every cell in your body, in my body, has a code. It's coded to operate according to that, that code. And, and when, it, when it gets out of code, when it drifts, yes, yes. it's forming now um, what, what, what they call a cancerous cell. Because now it has violated the parameters of what it was designed to do, and now it's becoming something else. Well, now that wouldn't be so bad if that one cell would just stay to itself and... But, but cancerous cells aren't like that. Cancerous cells want, want the other good cells to conform to their design. And before you know it, that cancer will spread, metastasize through other parts of the body. And before you know it, you have not a body that's continuing to grow and healthy, but you'll have a body that's going to be in decline because the DNA has been distorted and corrupted by a cell that's doing its own thing. Now can we take that same principle and apply it? See, 
the church, because of its organizational drift, is, is cancerous. The cancer in the cell, in, in the church, is this idea of you and I operating according to our own thinking. Instead of, Jesus said, Jesus said look, if you're going to follow me, these are the requirements. So the, the church can drift from its, its design and become a cancerous. Instead of it benefiting every member, it now is going to hurt members. And, and I'm telling you, beloved, um, broken, hurt people hurt other people. See, that's, that's cancerous. And, and sometimes we, we can do what we think is the right thing. Oh, this is the right thing. And then, then, then we can do it with, with a spirit of, of anger and, and, and disrespect and dishonor. And, and what we're doing is destroying. And, and the scripture says, in fact, the Bible says here what? Where every part does its share causes growth of the body for the building up of itself. How? In love. So love, love is part of that DNA principle of how we operate. We, um, we're, we're, we're forced as well, um, you know, when we, when we drift, we drift sometimes because we, we, we get to this place in, in church, in organizations that, that, that have been around for years and years, we, 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 we sort of learn to do get the job done the way we feel it ought to be done. And, and, and what happens is when, when, we, when we do a job or do a role or play our role or do our ministry, we, we can assume that that's the way it ought to happen. We've been doing it this way. And, and so th then what we have is, is this conflict between a descriptive of what we do versus a prescriptive of what we ought to do. See, descriptive says we've done it all this time. This is what we are, who we are. We've done, we've done this for years and years. But the prescriptive, according to Jesus, gives the prescriptive. This is what we ought to do. And in church, churches drift. And this not only can happen in terms of our, um, our corporate life, but it can happen also in terms of our individual lives. We, we can uh, think and assume that because we've done it this way, it must be right. But Jesus, the word of God, gives us the prescriptive of how we ought to follow him. Amen. And sometimes we take the descriptive of what we're doing and we put that above the prescriptive of what we ought to do. That becomes a problem. And our culture is, is doing this. Our culture is uh, asserting to us that um, homosexuality, and I keep going back to it because it's an excellent illustration of this idea of drifting because our, our country and nation has drifted. Um, this, this idea of drifting because our morals and ethics can, can drift from, from what we do and describing, descriptive of what we do. This is what we do. Well, no, what we ought to do is look at the DNA, what we're, what, what's been prescribed. And, and um, our, our culture now has de determined that uh, men can marry men. I was sharing with our new members this morning that um, here for Man of Bible, we're putting, we're going to create a new, con a new constitution that every member is going to get a copy of. And in that new constitution is language which details, specifically details, um, what we believe here about marriage. Now, I'm not here to talk about same-sex marriage, but I'm just using it as an illustration. So we're going to put a prescriptive of what marriage is in the Constitution, and every member is going to have to sign off on it. I agree. I believe this. We're going to maintain a copy of that because we don't want, we know what, organizations do what? And that some way, now, this, now what I'm describing for you is that some churches are, have already gone through litigation because some in their body have drifted and now they think that it's no problem marrying men with men. See, what they're living is a description of what is going on, where the description of what is happening becomes their norm. Our norm can't be based on what is, what, what's happening, what they're doing, what they say, how they feel. 
what we do, because we don't want to drift, we want the prescriptive. What did God say? Amen. And you know what? We, we should be to the point where, when, when Jesus said it, when Jesus said it, he said, you, you can't be my disciple unless you what? Hate mother, father, sister, brother, wife, children, yea, even your own life. Amen. See, the church, in order to protect its, its drift, needs to stand on these principles, those yellow footprints. Take a stand and say, this is, this is where we stand. We're not moving. Amen. And we, we say it this way, in love, but even if it costs us, yes, sir. even if it costs me personally, even if it costs us corporately, we will suffer the consequences of doing what has been prescribed by Jesus Christ. Amen. The, the, the series that we're working on is this idea of seeking Jesus. And so we're going to be working through this idea of what it takes to renew our commitment and covenant and devotion to Jesus Christ. The first we've been working on for a couple of months has been seeking Jesus. The second will be sacrificing for Jesus. See, you can't follow Jesus unless you sacrifice. What, what, what kind of sacrifice? Everything. <laughs> really? Yeah, everything. He wants to own everything about you so that so that it gets to the point where even though your clothes are on your back you don't call them your clothes Amen. it's government issue <laughs> uncle sam gave me these to the point to the point where every believer now our possessions aren't really ours they belong to jesus Amen. and the question is are we using and sacrificing who we are what we have for his good See, we can drift and start living for ourselves. We're, we're going to be looking at that. See, we, we, we call um, things ours, my, my clothes, my car, my house. And it's not. I, I remember, and I, I'm going to jokingly say that because my sons are here, but they, they grew up in, in uh, my wife's, and Ian's looking at me. <laughs> Where's he going? <laughs> but uh, they, they grew up in our home. And, and we, we, we assigned them rooms. This is your room. This is your room. This is your room. And they had their, their rooms. And, and um, now, now we knew, we knew, now, now we're calling it their room, but in, in actuality, it wasn't their room. Amen. I don't know that they understood it that way, but the, the idea is, is that we, we gave that assignment, but, but the whole idea is, is that the, the, the rooms belonged, as it were, to Tracy and I, and ultimately to the Lord, right? Amen. And and what's what's interesting now? What's interesting now is that what what when when we talk about our room in that house, that there's certain things you do and you don't do. Have responsibilities, and and the, the guys learned responsibilities in their room, and now now they have their own rooms. And, and so when, when we had um, um, curfews um, on, on the house, um, you, you know, you need to be in um, a certain hour. Well, you know what? Now, now they can, they have their own room, their own house, and now they can come and go. Well, maybe not. Um, <laughs> you better ask uh, Nat and Donnyell and... Uh, <laughs> But you know, you know what? You know what? See, they learn this, this idea of, of respecting and honoring that woman. They learned it in what? Our house. That's, that's what the place of, of the home is for, to nurture and develop that will, that mind, so that when a, when a Natalie or Donnie L comes along, they, you know, they'll know how to respond properly to, to a woman and how to treat her, how to respect her, and how to honor, honor the children. They, they know because they've learned, they've been, they've been, their wills were formed. Jesus wants to do the same thing for us, beloved. And if you don't let him conform your will, you know what's going to happen? You become a cancer. You're going to eat up not only your own life, but you're going to destroy the spirit, the heart, the mind of other people. And Jesus doesn't like it when people hurt his body. That's why he said, do it in love. 
See, love is that principle that will dictate how you treat, how you treat one another. So we're going to be seeking Jesus. We want to be sacrificing for Jesus. We're going to be suffering for Jesus. You mean Jesus calls us? To, yes. Yes, he does. We're going to be looking at being sanctified in Jesus. Amen. Set apart for him. We're going to be looking at being satisfied with him. Oh, what a call that is. That he calls us to be satisfied in him and him alone. You know what? You really can't enjoy life until Jesus is your satisfaction. When he becomes your satisfaction, you really can enjoy life. You really can. Because it doesn't matter if, if you hear a bad report from the doctor. It doesn't matter. My satisfaction is in Jesus. He's my hope. He's my song. He's my peace. He's my joy. Whatever comes or goes. Satisfied with Jesus alone. Serving saints for Jesus. Speaking to sinners about Jesus. These are the prescriptives. Of what it takes for us to, to maintain integrity in the body. And not drift. Father, we, um, it, it, it's a real chore. It's, it's a work yes, it in us. There is a natural tendency for us to drift. We, oh God, forgive us. We want our own comfort. And we, we think that's a good thing. Forgive us for valuing our own comfort and peace above you.